Hey y'all, it's Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. Look out, we smoking. All right, welcome back. Tom Gresham here. Yeah, 866 Talk Gun is the number here, or just dial me at Tom Talk Gun. If you're on hold, don't go anywhere. We're going to get to you. Uh, we do have a guest coming in right now. It's a, a real pleasure. Actually, it's a, it's a joy when you have a state legislator, a representative, who's also a really, really good competitive shooter. That's the case with uh, Louisiana, where I live. Our representative, Blake Miguez, joins us right now, shooter and legislator. Hello, Blake. How are you, sir? Tom, how are you doing? Happy to be on the show today. I am well. The only real question is, and we'll talk about legislation in a minute, are you getting any shooting done? Well, I just got off the shooting range. I shot about a thousand rounds this morning. I just got done cleaning my gun, getting ready for the world championship next weekend. So I'm sneaking it in there in between uh, legislating. <laughs> okay, our state legislator is getting ready for the world championship. Shoots a thousand rounds in the morning. That's that's a good morning, man. Yeah, that's a very good morning. I've got I've got to keep up with my good friend Max Michelle, who's from Covington, Louisiana. I believe the area you're from, and yep. uh, I travel around the country with him, and we shoot regularly together. Man, uh, that's a horse to try to keep up with right there. Oh, he, that's, that's a thoroughbred, so I've got to do everything I can on the weekends outside of legislative just to practice. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's it like being the gun guy in the legislature? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great responsibility to have because in Louisiana, you know, if you, if you look at across our demographics across the state, you know, a super majority believe in the Second Amendment and their right to defend themselves. And I'm just trying to make the legislator the legislature reflective of that. And if you look at Louisiana's gun laws, they don't necessarily line up with the people back home. And we're working really hard to move Louisiana up on the list to be a more pro-gun friendly state. Well, we made some headway this uh, couple of weeks ago. We had, uh, we have one day, for those who don't know, we have one day when you kind of hear the gun bills. And it's one of those, it's always a challenge to see, can we get people to show up? Because we know the moms demand people in the, every town, you know, the Bloomberg groups are going to be there. And so I went in there, and uh, you know, I was going to be there. When I walked in, I was knocked out. We probably had the anti-gun folks outnumbered by eight to one, I would guess. It was, I mean, as you sat there, you're looking out there, that had to be amazing. Yeah, it really was. I could tell after we, we passed the bill at the very end, all the cheering and clapping going on, but we had, we had the room packed with pro-gunners. We really did. So if you would kind of talk about the bills that uh, we were working on there, because they actually have application across the country. No matter where you live, this is important stuff. Well, I, I've, I've been working on two two bills, and the first one had went through commerce earlier in the week, and the bill that you heard was um, going through criminal justice. But the first bill I dealt with was the whole Bank of American City Group um, issue with their going in and telling lawful gun owners um, or, or gun businesses in the state if they don't stop selling certain firearms or adopt anti-gun policies, and they would terminate financial services with them. Mm-hmm. So we brought a bill. It, it made it off of the House floor, and it's headed to the Senate. It basically prohibits financial institutions from refusing to provide financial services to a person or trade organization, and the key word is solely because they're involved in lawful commerce or firearms of ammunition. So that protects you know, Louisiana gun owners, dealers, trade associations, instructors, gunsmiths, shooting ranges, and those guys, um, they have a right to lawfully sell firearms and ammunition, and they don't need to, uh, a, a large banking group uh, terminating their financial services and putting them out of business overnight because they're following the law. This is really an outgrowth and maybe kind of the echoes of the Obama-era Operation Choke Point when the federal government went to financial institutions and said, you know, uh, we would look a lot more favorably on your operations if you weren't doing business with certain types of businesses like pornography and guns. And it's not that we're saying that you're going to be banned from that. It's just that we're going to be giving you an awful lot more scrutiny. In other words, it was a threat. And so a lot of them started pulling out. I remember talking with uh, Kelly McMillan at McMillan Stocks. He said, yeah, we got, they just told us, the bank called us and said, you know, we're just not going to be doing business with anybody in the gun business. We're closing your account out. That, that's what we're well, talking about, isn't it? I'll give you some examples of what they did. So they came into a small Louisiana business, let's say, for example, and said, okay, you're selling high-capacity magazines. We believe that's socially irresponsible. You're selling 
um, uh, semi-automatic rifles to 18 to 20 year olds. We believe that's socially irresponsible. Or you're selling semi-automatic rifles that are really scary looking called AR-15s, and that's socially irresponsible. But what I'm doing with this piece of legislation is letting those banks know that you're not allowed to do social policy making from the boardroom. You know, the legislature is charged with making social policy making. Those guys need to focus on the banking business, and these businesses rely to their detriment on financial services. You're talking about small Louisiana businesses that are just following the law. And the legislature decided that all these things that they're doing are legal because we have a pro-gun state and we believe in the Second Amendment. And look, my bill is tightly tailored. The Bank Association did have some initial concerns with it. And we wanted to make sure that it's just as, if this just protects them if they're discriminated against for the sole purpose that they're selling farms and ammunition. This is not going to give them a get-out-of-jail-free card if they decide to stop paying their notes or or if they're not a good commercial customer for some sure. commercial term. And then we, we, we were focused on giving a remedy to those businesses, and we, we basically have it set up where they would file a complaint with the attorney general's office. There would be an investigation. If there was credible information, excuse me, credible evidence that was presented, then the attorney general had a few remedies that he could seek. But we're not the first state to do this. Um, this is a big push with the National Shooting Sports Foundation. They passed similar legislation in Georgia, and Louisiana would be the second state to uh, pass it. Um, if it would make it through the Senate. And, and to state the obvious, a, a, say a gun store, if the company that processes its credit cards says, we're just not going to do that anymore, you literally cannot have a retail business that cannot process credit cards. It, it could actually just put them out of business, couldn't it? it? It's very difficult because they need cash flow just like any other business. And they have to stock inventory, and these are small Louisiana small businesses. So if they have to send a uh, invoice that doesn't get paid for 30, 60 days, then it can really restrict on how they can carry their inventory. So my bill actually deals with and includes payment processors and credit card companies. It's all financial institutions. So PayPal and Square and those different companies that have firearms policies that or policies that just discriminate against firearm dealers and ammunition dealers, that would be mm-hmm. against the law in Louisiana if this bill passed. Now, not to get too deep into the weeds, but it's gone over into the Louisiana Senate. Now, I understand that it got rooted to, uh, was it justice? It should be sitting in commerce, uh, should it? Yeah, well, but it, it should go to commerce, which all banking legislation does, and that's where the House Senate, but we got rerouted to um, ways and means that deals with tax law, and it's mm-hmm. got about I think seven Democrats, two Republicans on the committee. I can't remember the exact makeup, but we're um, we're asking the president of the Senate to reconsider the um, the referral because it would be more appropriate in the Commerce Committee, and that's what we're hoping that he'll do because it seems like it was sent to a committee that doesn't see eye to eye with the rest of Louisiana, sort of an anti-gun well, um, okay. committee. Well, okay, maybe you can't say it, but I can say it. This is, this is basically a DOA. This thing is dead on arrival, and I think that was the intention of moving it over to that committee. So I'm just going to say, if you're in Louisiana, uh, contact the – is it uh, Joe Alario is the president of the Senate? John Alario is the president. John Alario, yeah. He, con- contact him and say, look, let's get this uh, bill where it needs to go. Which committee does it need to be at? It should go to the Commerce Committee, which deals with all banking legislation. Okay, sounds good. Hey, Blake, and that when's we're, a lot more a lot more friendly, and we have some other gun legislation coming through the process. We're we're trying to tighten up and clarify the preemption laws in Louisiana. I have another bill that that was the one we heard in criminal justice when uh, right. you saw the the room that was packed. Right, went went through there. We packed the room, and one of the things the takeaways from this is when we show up, we win. It really is that simple. We had them beat by eight to one in terms of attendance. We were all there with had uh, the shirts on that basically identified us as the gun groups. And when you show up, you win. If you don't show up, you can't win. Simple as that. Now, now Tom, we, you know, we, we're all against violence, but, you know, we're, we're not just going to focus on gun violence. We need to be worried about all violence. And if we're going to have people the ability to defend themselves against violent criminals, they need to have be able to carry a gun and defend themselves. And mm-hmm. having gun-free zones and allowing locals to pass laws that are more restrictive in the state level is not the solution to New Orleans um, crime rate. So, you know, we, we, have, we have the same end goal, but I believe the other side just, um, so I believe they somehow live in a, a fantasy land thinking that they can just make criminals follow gun laws. They, the, only, the only thing that stops a criminal is a law-abiding citizen that's carrying a firearm. That's just it. Blake McGuez, Louisiana legislature and top competitive shooter. When is the world uh, competition that you're headed to? Well, we're, 
we're headed to the Steel Challenge, which is next weekend in Talladega, Alabama. A beautiful shooting range out mm-hmm. there. I'm going to drive over there and meet my good friend Max Michelle and see if I can try to keep up with him because I think he's been practicing all week and I just started this weekend. So <laughs> we'll see how it works out. Hey, he's a he's a professional shooter, you know, and you actually have a different <laughs> job. Yeah, I know. I, got, I keep my hands full, but um, I, I love to shoot. I love to defend the Second Amendment and. Uh, that's what I enjoy doing. And thank you so much, Tom, for having me on the show. And um, thank you so much for all the listeners for your support. And thank you for what you do. I, we are very fortunate to have you in the legislature. Blake McGuess, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. We are open lines for you. If you'd like to be a part of this, give me a holler. Just call me at Tom Talk Gun. Since 1902, Norma has built a reputation for its dedication to quality, precision, and reliability. Norma now offers a line of personal defense handgun ammunition. The monolithic hollow point 9mm is designed for the ultimate in performance across all sizes and barrel lengths. This bullet delivers unprecedented expansion and quick energy transfer for great stopping power. Norma offers proven ammunition for hunting, competition, self-defense, and more. Find yours at norma-ammunition.com. You got your carry permit, and that's good. But you know you could use more training. Get the DVDs, which have what you need. Springfield Armory presents Concealed Carry 1 and Concealed Carry 2 with Bata Group. Learn specific concealed carry skills from Top Gun fighting trainers. Get trained. Be prepared. This really is life and death. ShopGunTalk.com that's shopguntalk.com. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together The time is now to rescue our wetlands. The Ruger pistol that started it all is now even better. The Ruger Mark IV has the same great look as the Mark III, but now its simple one-button takedown means less time taking apart your gun and more time shooting it. Disassemble it in seconds for no hassle cleaning. Learn more about the Target, Hunter, and 2245 light Mark IV series models at Ruger.com. The Ruger Mark IV, another rugged, reliable firearm from Ruger. All right, now it's time for you to be on Gun Talk, 866-TALK-GUN. Pretty much anything on your mind. Also, stories about your mom. Was your mom a shooter? Is your mom a shooter? A hunter? Got a gun story that involves your mother? Love to hear that. This is Mother's Day. Let's talk about that stuff. Again, 866-TALK-GUN. Mark's on uh, line five out of Billings, Montana. Mark, thank you for your patience. You held quite a while. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm calling because I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. My Mm -hmm. 14-year-old boy is a life member of the NRA. Uh, I've always been a supporter, but I'm, I'm pretty... I, I know the press wants to destroy the NRA, but I think the, the board of directors needs to come out with a, a better statement than they've had. Um, that they, they need to show us that they're going to be fiscally responsible. And until they do that, I'm going to have a hard time sending them any more money. Well, I'm hearing from people like you, Mark, who say, look, I'm a, I'm a life member. I'm a benefactor level member. I donate. And in the aftermath of all this bad news, this shady operation, that's all, I mean, it's, that's the best I can use to describe what's going on there. Uh, what they're getting is emails from the NRA saying, donate, donate, donate. Uh, you need to help us. Give us money to protect us against this onslaught, this attack that we're under right now. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. You're being exposed for wasting tens of millions, actually really hundreds of millions of dollars of members' money, and your response to that is, give us more money. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with them right now, and I, I mean, I, the, the, the problem, we need, 
we need people fighting for the Second Amendment rights, and they do a good job there. But, you know, I, I, I'm I not a wealthy person. I work pretty hard for my money, and I'm just not going to give it away for other people to, to blow it. I think that there are an awful lot of people who are just like you who are saying, look, I, I will support the NRA, but not with the current leadership, not with what you guys have been doing, not with what we now know you have been doing. Uh, $40 million to your PR agency creating these god-awful things like Carry Guard, that program that they created, spending tens of millions of dollars on outside legal fees to defend themselves, and, and you know, net jets, private jets all over the world going back and forth, uh, just, I mean, literally <sighs> charter jets to go on shopping trips. It's just, okay, it's time to... <sighs> Come on, NRA board. You, you got to do something, and you got to stand up, and you got to be transparent because you can't hide behind. Well, we were in executive session, and we're not allowed to talk about. It. Well, then come out of executive session and do it where the members can see it. Otherwise, frankly, and I don't know about you, Mark. I'm speaking for myself. At this point, as I told one of the board members, I said, "Look, I got one foot out the door. I don't trust you guys anymore. You need to give us a reason to trust you." I agree, and, and the crazy part is. What the liberals could never do, they're going to do it to themselves. They're going to destroy the NRA if they don't come clean with it and show people yep. what's going on and how they're making corrections. Exactly. Mark, thank you for your call. I sure appreciate that. I appreciate your patience there. I uh, got this uh, cool note. Let's see. Let me make sure I got the right person. From Craig. Craig says, uh, the Springfield 10 millimeter is very interesting to me when we hike in the mountains. Yeah. Like bear gun, lion gun, wolf gun, protection against four-legged critters. Uh, he says, I'd be interested to hear more about the pistol and how you would carry it. We will have backpacks on, which leads us to the interesting question of how do you carry a pistol, self-defense pistol, when you have on a backpack? The backpack has shoulder straps, but also has a waistband. And will that waistband be above the belt line of your pants? You could wear a belt gun, belt holster. Generally, you want that padded waistband from your pack a little bit lower on your hips. It's a, it basically rides on the hips, not on the waist. That would put it in a bad place. And I've mentioned this before, and several people mentioned a rig called the, the Kenai holster. And I... It's a chest holster. It goes right in the center of your chest. And people are actually even had uh, adding them to their binocular pouch. You know, a lot of hunters now keep their binoculars in a pouch and a chest rig, and they're putting the pistol over the top of that. The idea is that you have this pistol right square over your sternum in a good holster, and it's out of the way. It's not bumping into anything, but also the straps for your pack don't interfere with it. And... <laughs> I just had a thought. Think of it as a high appendix carry. <laughs> it's right in front, and you can reach down there and get your pistol out in a hurry. Uh, I'm I'm intrigued. I do not have one of these. I've not used one. In fact, um, if you have used a chest rig like this, whether it's the Kenai holster or another one, I would love to hear from you and get the uh, experience that you have with this. Give me a holler, 866-TALK-GUN. We'd love to know a little bit more about how that's worked. Let's talk with Matt on line three. He's in Arizona. Hey, Matt, uh, you're a reloader, I take it. Yes, I am. I've uh, been reloading for over 23, 24 years. Well, when I started, I bought whatever equipment I could afford. One of them was a RCBS hand primer. Uh huh. And since I purchased it, I've lost the priming pins. Replaced them with antennas from cars and uh, springs from spring kit, but the handle finally went out. It wouldn't hold the uh, pivot assembly. Uh -huh. So I wrote the company and asked them, What's the deal? how could I go ahead and purchase one? Uh -huh. Well, they went ahead and uh, said, no, that's under warranty. Uh -huh. And they shipped along with all the inner guts for free. Basically, a total tune-up with all the modern pins and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll tell you, I, I love that company. As far as uh, reloading, they're, they're good on their word without any questions. Huh. How? And, and you've been using RCBS stuff for how long? Oh, about 20 years. Whoa. 
you know, it's just one of those examples, and we talk about this all the time on the show here, of the companies in our industry, the firearms industry, and this, you know, gun companies, uh, ammo companies, optics companies, in this case, reloading companies, that go way beyond anything you'd expect. I mean, that's, you expected to pay for this, right? Oh, I did. I was going to buy a whole new handle. They said, nope, that's under warranty. (laughs) And I'm telling you, I hear every week somebody sends me a story about, you know, this gun company, that gun company. I've had this gun for 10 years and had a problem with it. And I just said, look, you know, I I just want it fixed. You know, let me know what it costs. And they send it back and it's fixed. Or they sometimes they'll actually send back a new gun. They just say, okay, yeah, we took care of that. Here's, Here's your new gun. It's crazy. Well, that's what they told me. They told me if these parts don't work, send the unit back, and they'll send me a brand new one. Wow. Well, of course, the other thing that does is that makes you a customer for life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like I told them, uh, I'm the one that wore it out. They said, well, it shouldn't have worn out. Well, it's going to wear <laughs> out because I do a lot of reloading. Yeah. So. All right. Well, look, I appreciate it. That's a great range report and uh, a good uh, attaboy to RCBS. Good company. Been around a long, long time. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, it's amazing, the uh, the companies we have, and how good they all are, and they make good stuff. And what's interesting is that, look, we, uh, we talk about how firearms usually last a lifetime or more. But that's not to say that things don't break. And frankly, sometimes they wear out. Some people like uh, our previous guest, Blake Miguez, he shot a thousand rounds this morning before coming on the show. It's Mother's Day. He's out there getting ready for a competition. Uh, folks like that wear guns out. I mean, when you put a thousand rounds a week through it, some of these guys put a thousand rounds a day through guns, stuff wears out. But it's amazing how the gun companies will stand behind them and take care of them for us. And it's not just one or two of the companies. It's a lot of the companies. In fact, I would say most of them have those kind of policies. And even if it's not a formal policy, a lot of times they'll just take care of it for you and say, look, we'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. We got you back. 866-TALK-GUN. Tom Gresham here. Be right back with more Gun Talk. A girl can't go wrong with something in basic black. Like... An AR-15. Some things never go out of style, like Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. You know, it's Mother's Day, and I'm thinking about my mom. She's long gone now, uh, but she was like the re- original steel magnolia. Might, on a lucky day, be five feet tall. Probably not really that tall. <laughs> the only child of a... A doctor in South Carolina, she was kind of a Scarlet O'Hara type, didn't know how to boil water when she got married, didn't, never had to, and became a terrific cook, I mean like world-class cook, had never shot a gun, married this gun guy named Gritz, ended up going all over the world, shot all over the world, became a really good shot. I was thinking about her and guns and the, the stories. Well, she took me hunting with her, deer hunting, before I was born. Yeah, she was, I don't know, eight months pregnant, something like that. Because I'm a November baby. So she was in Arizona. Actually, Dad was at deer camp. She was with him. And uh, one afternoon, she said, well, I'll, I'll just go out there. Because she was a painter. I'm just going to go out and do some painting. He said, well, take your rifle with you. You, know, you might see something. So she's out there on the side of a hill painting. And this mule deer doe walks up the ridge on the other side. And so she took her rifle out and she shot this doe. But she was so big, pregnant with me, she couldn't go get it. Not a problem. So Mary goes back to Gritz and hands him the painting she was working on. And she marks on it. She says, the deer's right there. <laughs> he takes the painting. They go out there. They find this dough out there. Get it. You know, clean it. Bring it back in. Good to go. So uh, that was my, I guess, my first hunting experience. It was a little bit before I was born. I got started early. Uh, because she was short, shotguns didn't fit her. You know, and Dad would take a shotgun that had a regular standard 14-inch length of pull how long the stock is, and he would do a pretty radical cut on it, cut a full inch off of it, 
And that just wasn't it. She's still struggling. So one time he was out of town, and she took her Winchester 101, 20 gauge over and under, that he had cut the stock off. And she said, that's not going to get it done. She took it to a gunsmith. She had another inch cut off, 12 inch length of pull. That is short, short. And after that, she was something. She could smoke some birds. Now, not like her first dove hunt he took her on. Because I think they had a 20-gauge Winchester Model 12 for her. First dove hunt. And she had not seen doves before. And Dad's with her. And then Dad went off went somewhere else, in a, a other part of the field. And he hears some shooting back there. And he comes back. And he said, well, how'd you do? She said, I got a bunch of them. Oh, okay. Where are they? Well, they're there right there. Well, all these doves had yellow breasts on them. She had done a number on the meadowlark population in that part of the world. Statute of limitations is well beyond uh, going out at this point, so we can talk about it. But, uh, yeah, yeah, she was something. I remember uh, they were hunting ducks down in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And both of them actually, because Dad loved his uh, Winchester 101 20 gauge over and under. And she had hers. And they had uh, this little bitty Mayan guide, this fellow. And he's no bigger than mom, maybe a little bit smaller. And they had a morning of shooting, and he was just basically kind of laughing. He said, uh, Senor, you know, bang, bang. And then he makes a motion like the dove, uh, the ducks keep flying. He says, uh, Senor, Senora, bang, bang. And he makes a motion like they die and go down. She just outshot this famous uh, gun writer guy, Grits. So that was kind of the, the whole deal. She, let me see. She had, uh, well, I still have her two fifty seven Roberts rifle. Really a nice, and it was the first center fire rifle I ever fired was uh, her two fifty seven Roberts. It's probably, honestly, why I have a soft spot, spot for that cartridge. And now I have one, two, three, three rifles. I think three. Yeah, three rifles and two fifty seven Roberts. And it's, it's funny, I was just looking at, well, maybe I should do a tw- 25-06. And then I looked at it and said, yeah, but there's only 200 feet per second difference in the bullets. And the Roberts shoots so soft and kills deer just as dead as the 25-06, or as anything else, frankly. And so I just I just love the Roberts. So that was, uh, that was Mom's gun. She also had a Browning A5. Uh, again, stock cut off. She had a, a, a Winchester Model 12 with a poly choke on it. We still have that one. A little bit short stock. That's kind of the starter gun for kids in the family. Uh, a great pump shotgun with that goofy poly choke on the end. So that was part of the deal there. But yeah, maybe five feet tall in some shoes, but a powerhouse to be sure. So when it comes to talk about uh, moms and guns, and hunting and shooting, uh, I put my mom right up there with everybody else. Great memories, and a lot of the great memories I have of my mother are of her shooting and the guns she had, and it's just fun stories. If you have stories about your mom and hunting and guns or anything else, now's the time to share them. It's Mother's Day. I'm Tom Gresham. We'll be right back with more Gun Talk. It's back. The Smith & Wesson 10mm Revolver. Yes, the Model 610 is back in 4 and 6.5 inch barrels. Six shot moon clips full of powerful 10mm rounds. Plus, you can shoot 40 s and ammo in it too. Stainless steel, black synthetic finger groove grips, interchangeable front sight with an adjustable rear sight. Take it to 10 with the Model 610 Revolver. Visit smith-wesson.com. When someone leaves you their gun collection, you may want a few, but what do you do with the rest? How do you sell them? Who do you call? Well, I call Johnny Dury at Dury's Guns. Whether you're selling one gun or 500, they'll tell you what it's worth and write you a check. Simple, quick, easy, fair. I trust Dury's Guns. Give them a call. Dury'sGuns.com. Hi, this is Tom Gresham from Gun Talk. America is losing critical wildlife habitat at a rate of one football field every hour. 
It's happening on the Louisiana coast, but it's critical to all sportsmen and conservationists. These precious wetlands provide winter habitat for more than 10 million ducks and geese annually, waterfowl that migrate north through dozens of states. Don't shrug it off. Get involved. You can help. Visit vanishingparadise.org. Designed to be the ultimate choice in concealed carry pistols, Kimber's Striker Fired Evo SP features an innovative grip system that eliminates hardware on the grip surface, a magazine release for right or left handed shooters, all metal construction for reduced muzzle rise, and ledged night sights for single hand manipulations. Kimber's Evo SP is the ideal choice for shooters that demand a feature packed, compact size striker fired firearm. Find your Kimber at www.kimberamerica.com. Uh, Gary writes in and says, I have a question about these magnetic pistol holders. The magnets are pretty strong and wants to know, can they have an effect on the safety of the firearm or cause a malfunction? Hmm. I honestly had not thought about that. Um, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there are folks that sell these super powerful magnets. The application I have seen with it is um, in your car, basically sticking them underneath the dash. So you, when you get, I guess, I think this would be how you'd use it. When you get in your car, you would take the pistol out of your holster and stick it under the dash. And it's this powerful magnet's holding it there. And then if you needed it, you just reach down and grab it and snatch it off the magnet. Um... It would not be the first time that I've kind of missed the rationale behind it, but I don't get it. I don't understand that. And I, I guess people could say, well, it's faster, or I don't want to have to draw, or it's uncomfortable to sit with a gun. You know, if you can't sit in a chair or in your car when you're wearing your gun, you need a different holster or holster position. Um... I just, this is one of those I don't get it things. I, I don't understand what the advantage would be of taking the gun off of your yourself. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I just, I, I, if you have a thought on the whole idea of using a magnet to hold on to your gun, because one of the things I think about is, if I have to get out of the car in a hurry, if there's an emergency, I want my gun on me. I want it in the holster that's on my belt. Because if I have to bail out and take off running, I don't want to have to grab a gun and then have a, a gun in my hand. I want to be able to boogie, and then I, but I still have the gun with me wherever I go. If there's a crash and something happens, I don't want to have to gather up the gun. There's clearly something... I'm missing here, okay? I just clearly. Let's go to line one. Chris is with us out of Des Moines, Iowa. Hey, Chris, you made it on to Gun Talk. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, John with the Ranger Force. Perfect. I uh, got an Arsenal Sam 7T, which is an AK pistol. Got uh -huh. that to the range this afternoon, and it's absolutely awesome. <laughs> <laughs> an AK pistol. All right. First of all, the, the first obvious question is, why? Why did you get that? I uh, I actually have the full size rifle version of the same gun. Okay, so the you got a, a full size. You got a rifle version of an AK. You got a regular AK, and then you got an AK pistol. So if or, that even makes me ask the question again, why you have the rifle? Why the pistol? Well, you got to have them all, don't you? <laughs> okay, you win. <laughs> it's just a beautiful gun, and I thought the smaller version may be a little more fun as well. Well, so how does it run? Does it does it run okay for you? Like a top. That's terrific. The whole AR AK pistol phenomenon was lost on me at first, and then I kind of got it. And went, oh, what you're really? Now, do you have a uh, do you have an arm brace on it? Yes, sir. So it becomes almost like a quasi-SBR. Uh, 
Yes. Yes. In loose terms, yes. Yes, it is. There's a kind of a quasi-SBR, and I think that's what's happening. That's what people are doing with them, which is perfectly okay to me. It makes a lot of sense, and it, they're, they're actually pretty darn functional that way. I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you for that report. Cool, cool range report, by the way. Uh, let's see. I want to go down to line four with Jerry in Idaho. Uh, Jerry, what are you shooting there? Uh, i got a, a CZ uh, 527 American in 22 Hornet. Hornet. Now, there's a cartridge that's like an oldie but a goodie. Yeah, that's a real fun gun. Huh. Okay. And it's very accurate. I'm using some Hornaday 45 grain soft point match bullets, and it'll shoot sub inch if I can do my part. So, again, why the Hornet? There are a lot of great calibers out there. What is it about the Hornet that interests you? Well, it's it's uh, soft shooting. Uh, no, rec- I mean, no, no recoil. It mm-hmm. has a very light report. And uh, it's just a fun gun to shoot. Okay, good. And the CZ rifles are are very good. I think they are underappreciated. I think that's very much true. All right, you had a thought on the NRA thing that's going on. Yeah, the NRA, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things, you know, I'll always be for the NRA and everything, and we got to get this mess straightened out. But it's like a friend of mine, former Marine friend, he says, you know, he said he does things for the core, you know, to keep the... You got to keep the basics uh, sights on what's important, right? And let's get the thing straightened around, and let's get it, you know, back better than ever. Yeah, exactly. And then, frankly, I, I, I am very slow coming to this, and a lot of people are not going to like me saying it, but they're going to have to clean out all that stuff at the top. They got to clean out. Basically, got to have a broom and sweep out an awful lot of those folks that are at the top level because they're in like, like. I told somebody, I said, look, even if they are not the problem, they were there when the problem was developing, and their job was to keep an eye on it. So either they were part of the problem or they were incompetent and not seeing the problem. Either way, you don't deserve the job anymore. Yeah, things, you know, it has a tendency a lot of times people, they lose sight of their mission, you might say. And they need to understand that that's more important than what they get involved with. I'm, you know, and I'm convinced that for a lot of them, their mission has been making millions of dollars. And they, I, God, I hate to say this. I don't think, there are some of them there who simply don't care about the mission, about the the cause. It's just how do we make tens of millions of dollars? How do we milk this thing? And I want them, I want them gone. I want that agency, I want the PR agency gone. And I want a whole new slate of people at the top at the NRA. They used to say, you know, an old folk thing that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right. Well, and, in this case, uh, you yeah. Know, but we, you... we just have to remember that things can happen, but we can get them straightened out and go on. No, that's right. We need the NRA. We've got to keep the NRA. It is time for the board of directors to take control of that organization. They hire and fire. And if they say, well, you know, the bylaws say we can't fire. Well, you know what? Fix it. Do whatever it takes. Fix it. Suspend them. Put them to pasture. Even if you got to keep paying them, get them out of the way. Whatever you got to do. But some there's some folks on the board, men and women, who figuratively uh, have got to man up. They've got to cowboy up. Other otherwise, what good are they? What are they doing for us? The job is not to protect or serve the leaders. The job is to serve the members in whatever way you have to, whatever it is you have to do. I don't know what that is, but we certainly deserve to know what's going on. And telling us that they re-elected LaPierre by unanimous vote when I know that's not the case, that's no that's no way to operate. We, we deserve better than that. Back with the 866 Talk Gun. Get you in here, Tom Gresham. Let's go talk with Ray. He's in the Bronx. Line 5. Ray, you saw this story, I take it. Oh, it, it's, um, you know something? I, I think right about now there are at least two politicians in uh, Colorado, not to mention a certain Ms. Watts, who all look like Wiley Coyote. Uh, their big scheme to turn the death of uh, young uh, Kendrick into a anti-gun rally 
blew up in their faces magnificently. All right, let me, let me and, give the background here. We had the shooting yeah. at the STEM school in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Uh, this young man basically sacrificed himself, was a hero. There was a memorial planned for him, a celebration of his life. And what happened was the anti-gun politicians tried to take it over and make it all about gun control. And the students stood up and did a walkout and then came back in and started chanting mental health, basically shouting them down and telling them, no, this is not about gun control. This is about mental health and embarrassed the politicians and embarrassed the gun control people because they were doing what they always do, which is to dance in the blood of dead children to advance their political agenda. Precisely. And they thought the kids were a lot more gullible than they were, and they weren't. And uh, at least one sixth grader had told his father that if fighting was going down, I'm going down fighting. Him and his friends from the softball team had their bats ready in case they came down the hallway. So here's a question for you. What was different about this. What's different now than from the Parkland shooting where the students were happy to be made political pawns and to go to Washington, D.C. and stage these marches and get funded with tens of millions of dollars of Bloomberg's money? Why did the folks in Colorado stand up and walk out, the kids, and say, we're not going to be a part of your political play? Well, clearly to me, they recognize the fact that uh, hugging the floor and trying to become invisible and hoping for the best is not a plan. Mm-hmm. Having a mindset to to resist is a plan. Well, they also, frankly, were inspired, I think, by the actions of their fellow student who charged the gunman, knocked him down, I gather, in the process, and ended up saving lives and maybe there maybe people are waking up to the fact that that's you have to stop it now hiding in the corner just means you're going to die in the corner you, you know no matter what it is if you all rush this guy you're going to be able to take him down and yes somebody's going to get hurt but if you don't do it a lot of people are going to get hurt that's really the the math on the whole thing uh, exactly and you know it would have been a horrible disgrace had they succeeded in turning this into a rally as well well, and of course, they've been able to do that successfully. And so, you know, they were assuming that that would happen again. By the way, this young man, Kendrick Castillo, I do not want to forget his name. Uh, Kendrick Castillo, he was 18 years old. He was killed at the shooting there when he charged the gunman. And, you know, there it is. It's the whole let's roll 9-11 on the airliner idea that we are not going to let you do this. It's really simple as that. We are not going to let you get away with this. We are going to stop you knowing that it's exceedingly dangerous for us to take this action. And that that's what Kendrick did. Hey, Ray, thank you for your call. Appreciate that, sir. Yeah, good on those students for waking up to the reality of you must provide your own protection. You are your own rescuer. You are your own first responder, whether you have a gun, whether you have a baseball bat, whether you have nothing. If you hide in the corner, you will die in the corner. I get it. Run, hide, fight. But you know what? If six people run at this guy and take him down, maybe one of them gets hurt, maybe one of them gets killed. But you save the others. Otherwise, he gets to shoot everybody. It really is simply mad.